Welcome to season four of And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of artists and writers over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life, the industry, politics, composition, whatever. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. I'm producing this with The Great Joe London, Big Deal Music Publishing, and Mega House Music Management. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, follow us on our socials, find out about special events, or buy some of our merchandise, go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. Oh, and if you enjoy And The Writer Is, please rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your preferred podcast listening site is. Hey, I don't know what kind of speakers you guys listen to at home, but recently my friends at Sono sent me a new speaker and I took it out of the box, downloaded the app, set it up in no time, and sure enough, my living room sounds basically like my studio. The full frequency range is there. It's clear. My vocals were clear. My bass was clear. I now am playing the album I've spent years on, The Wrong Man. I'm playing for my friends and family on a Sono speaker that you can get for a pretty affordable cost. You don't need to be getting the kind of speakers that you put in the studio. You don't need to get studio monitors for people to enjoy the full frequency range of music. Now you can just get it at www.sonos.com. You can go and order one and it shows up at your door. And if you want two, three, four, your app is intuitive. It's just going to figure it out for you. You can listen to whatever streaming services you want on it, Apple, Spotify, and you're going to see how easy it is in no time. So again, if you want to get studios, speakers, quality at an affordable cost, go to Sonos.com and get your speaker now. Again, thank you, Sonos. And uh, trust me, go grab some. Welcome to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Today's legend is a pop rock staple. This notoriously insane guitar player has won the Grammy for Producer of the Year, has co-written multiple number one songs, and sold like 60 million records. The greatest pop a and of all time, Clive Davis, referred to his production as the sound of Top 40 Radio. He absolutely owned the genre, having worked with everyone from Sheryl Crow, Bon Jovi, Miley Cyrus, Melissa Etheridge, Michelle Branch, Keith Urban, Jewel, Colby Calais, the Goo Goo Dolls, Pink, Stevie Nicks, etc., etc., etc. This New Yorker is part of the last breed of producer who actually plays an instrument as well as he produces produces records side note before i had a beard multiple people said i looked like you (laughs) and therefore the writer is the most handsome guest we've had john shanks you know i'm sitting across from you thinking there's a powerfully attractive man i'm not afraid to say it yeah you know um uh you know i'm blushing and uh (laughs) um my wife is in the house and uh tell her that when you walk out um so yeah, we were, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into the conversation before this. We were, we were talking about, you know, how, in a way, how people are learning about how we get paid, you know, and, and that part of the Music Modernization Act, which by the time this comes out will be law. Um, but the, the um, learning about how people get paid and how you get paid as a songwriter and as an artist is as important as learning your art. And I, I got a degree in music, and I used to say that getting this degree was going to teach me how not to get screwed in the music business. But what it really did was it taught me how I'm getting screwed in the music business. <laughs> And there's probably nothing more valuable than going into a deal knowing how you're going to get screwed because they're investing in you for something that you provide. And if you understand the parameters of your deal as much as you can and ask as many questions as you can before you sign that deal, you know, then at least when the shit hits a fan and you're not making as much money as you hoped or it's not that you know when you have this vision of what what success really means and you look at well this person's made this much money off me if, the only people who really in my opinion tend to get screwed are people who uh, weren't encouraged to have re- representation 
So they didn't know going into the deal how to ask certain questions. They just signed something. Mm. But it tends to be either those people <clears throat> or people who didn't care to ask the questions. And then when they found out how they're getting screwed, they were totally disappointed that they were stuck in this deal. Um, because no one explained to them, yo, don't do that 12 song MDRC. You will never get out of this deal for your entire lifetime. Yeah. Well, I came up through, I guess, a period of time where um, when I first got my first publishing deal, uh, which was with Virgin EMI, or Virgin that which became EMI, I was so grateful to have somebody believe in me as a writer. So here I am, you know, I'm writing songs in, you know, my apartment or I'm doing sessions and trying to just sustain myself as a musician and and, and make a living at at it. And then when um I would say I took it upon myself to I, I met a, a writer friend of mine or and we sat down and we said we're gonna write an album. We're going to write an album. And in 30 days, we wrote a song a day. And we basically wrote 30, you know, whatever, 25, 30 songs in uh, a period of time. And um, on an eight track reel to reel, you know, with one drum machine. And when is this? This is probably um, early, yeah, like 90. 90, yeah, I would say 90. 1990 in New York? Out here. I, oh, I, I I I grew up in uh, Manhattan, but then my last year of high school, I went to Beverly Hills High School. I see. Okay. So middle of my junior year, we moved to California. My family. So yeah, so so my point is that um, so we did this record. We did it ourselves, and we went after management. Perry Watts Russell ended up managing us, who worked at Capitol years later. Later signed Radiohead. Yeah. Uh, okay. was a, or a, a, a yeah a, a part of I believe so part yeah. of that but also yeah. managed David and David and Tony Childs you know yeah. and, uh, my, uh, um, uh, some other artists uh, and um, he really loved what we did and I'm just getting to the publishing thing as fast as possible so we ended up getting signed to Electra so here are, as artists as an artist as a band. Or the guy it was under Vincent Rocco. It's the guy. I don't know why I'm starting here, but I'm getting to the publishing thing, which is, um, which is that entrepreneurial spirit where we just did it ourselves. And I, now I played on a lot of records and toured with Melissa Etheridge at this point, and but um, and been around enough. Playing on a lot of records is great as a as a musician as well as a writer because you learn. Uh, you learn other people's songs and you learn the process of making records and you know I had the luxury of working with all these amazing producers and you start to realize oh this guy is great with vocalists this guy gets amazing drum sounds this guy's it's all about the food and the coffee this guy's a, so you learn you know and you go and you take notes you just cat you know you just slowly put that in the back of your mind and if ever one day I have the opportunity um I want to emulate that or be like that or I, I respect that guy. So I want to, or a gal, or I want to be like that. So um, anyway, back. So we, we we got signed to Electra, five album deal. So here, one minute, I'm. How old were you? I was 25, six, oh. five, somewhere in there. And um, yeah, so we got five album deal. What was the band called? It was Vincent Rocco. It was okay. under the artist's name. Oh, I that see. That was the okay. classic, like, mate, it's going to be under my name. I yeah. Was, I was like, okay, all right, buddy, okay. Right. Which was good because it kept me, I was still producing the record and I was still writing all the songs and I was playing, you know, keyboards and guitar and it was still my baby. So if it failed, <laughs> I, and, no skin off of me, you know. Right. And I'd already had the experience of touring a lot with different with Tina Marie and Melissa Etheridge, and so and I saw what it took to kind of go from nothing. You know, I played in tons of bands in high school and paid my dues and played every club in this city, and and uh, I had a whatever a popular band in high school, and we did well. And but so anyway, so but the thing that came out of the record deal was I got a, um, you know, someone was like, hey, you should get a publishing deal. 
And um, now for a writer at where my head was at, not knowing, that was a huge thing. It almost meant more to me than the record deal. Because um, when I went in, I did the rounds a little bit and uh, I met Donna Young, who works with Paul McCartney now. And, um, and she's like, I'm going to sign you. I love your songs. I see who you are and I see where you're going. And, you know, for a young knucklehead, that was huge for me. And it was a crappy deal, but I was grateful. But you knew, did you know going into it that it was a crappy deal? Mm, no, because what made I it, didn't. What re- made it crappy? I think I learned the process after I had already signed my name. Sure. I think, you know, oh, cut and release. Okay. Right. I'm in a band. I, I can write these amount of songs and have them released a year. Right. 10 songs a year? No problem. Whoa. Oops. Oops, kids. No. And I, I think that look, I, reversions. What's oh yeah, re, in perpetuity. That sounds like a sexy word, but that's that's not you know. Looking in, looking at what MDRCs are. I don't know why we're starting so thick today, but we are. But um, we'll, we'll go back. Tears to Tears will be shed. Yeah, here. exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> MDRCs are basically um, in a lot of publishing deals. They say that you owe. You know, five songs, a five song M- MDRC, which means you owe five songs that need to be released by a major label and Re- uh, five 100% recorded, songs, and, recorded and, and, released. and released. So and, we can record, you and I, we could see it right now, right? right? You know, five songs, sure. but if that shit ain't right. coming out. We're- so for years, <laughs> for years, when there were so many albums coming out, you could make a three song, four song MDRC in a year, and it wouldn't be as crazy as it as it is now. Because it's it's if you meet your MDRC or a year, but a whatever, si- but also longer. but also a singles deal to me back then was the kiss of death. Like a singles deal, like you don't believe in me enough that you're not going to give me an album deal or a record right. deal. You're going to give me a singles deal. That is like you might as well just say I'm going to give you a demo deal. Yeah. You know, I'm going to make you wash my car and you know get me lunch and then you know I might write a song with you but it's you know you yeah all those little nuances are, are important to to know I, I was gonna say these publishers now are, some of them are willing to renegotiate the language on MDRC right. because there are no physical copies being released so some people are still stuck in a deal that says that they need to get X amount of songs released, and the way it's defined is a mecha- is a is a uh, like an actual CD, a, a vinyl record right, would right. count as a release, but if it's digital, it won't. Right. And and that can be an easy way for publishers who also are record labels to keep their writers in perpetuity if they don't renegotiate that language. It gets crazy, but look. On a positive note, <laughs> look. This is all honestly. This is all interesting. Stay because, in tune. <laughs> be, no, I think this is good because, to be honest, like the the people don't if they if you grow up without parents that are musicians, or you grow or you don't go to school for it, and you know that's that's when you find yourselves in these situations. So you know it's doing a service to go down these you know to to explain how these things work. But I think. For me, it was, I, I, you know, this is who, this is what I do. This is who I, I, I don't well, know. Any, the, I don't know anything else. Start from so. the beginning, because okay. you don't know anything else because you were born. Yeah, and you were born, <laughs> and you're like, now what? So you're born in New York, yeah, in Manhattan. Uh, yes, and your parents are also musicians. Uh, of my any sorts? dad uh, is still alive. He's a was a television producer oh. and, a, and a writer. Did he produce anything we know? Uh, he well, yes, he well, he was the executive producer producer of the Merv Griffin show. F- wow, for ten many years, uh, worked at Canada Camera, and he worked at he was vice president of ABC, created Good Morning America in 2020 and Nightline. Uh, my mother was a uh, a uh, incredible photographer, documentary filmmaker, and um, who's who of American women. Wow. Like 
eight years for over, you know, not in a row, but, you know, I think eight times. And the, but Did you know the how photo unique it was to, to have parents that were that artistic and, and also I, I knew career driven? Right. So they're very, both of them, uh, very independent, very driven, very Upper West Side, very, you know, very just super, wor- it's all, you know, work, 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 work. Work is, it's all about work. And work with a passion, not just, you know, uh, a paycheck. So, it, it um, you know, my some of my earliest memories are my mom in the, her dark room developing photos and, you know, me playing with my cars outside her door as she was developing photos and showing me that process and... Um, but she would, she covered the, you know, she went to Israel and covered the war and, you know, and, and so I, I saw that. And so I, I understood that, um, even though they were both, I would say workaholics, um, I could say, you know, you know, I, I make jokes that, you know, they were both black belt narcissists, you know, um, and I, but I have that, I'm, a, I'm, I'm pretty, um, I would say I'm a workaholic. I guess I'm happy when I'm tinkering or writing or reading or working. Or what about um, the negative part of being a workaholic? Well, you know, you, it's. <sighs> Do you know how to turn it off at all? I used to never turn it off, and then I learned, you know, many years of therapy <laughs> that it's a valve, and I used to think that you can't turn off the valve. Like you have to keep going. You know, I'm I'm a pretty obsessive compulsive person. Uh, a pretty addictive personality. So the idea of turning it off, I mean, for me meant it would go away. As a and did your parents ever turn it off? Um, no. My 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 mom passed two years ago, and my dad is still alive. And you know, they're both still selling. <laughs> you know, they're they're both. Yeah. They got a script and they've got an idea. My dad's writing his memoir right now, and you know, I'm trying to help him with technology, and I can't even get him to you know rewind his answering machine. So, yeah. So that's it's it, it, which is interesting because I see the things that you learn from your parents and that are create and creatively and and little life lessons. I mean, I remember when I was probably twelve. And my dad said to me, you know, you can be successful and be nice in this business. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know. It's probably the wisest thing, like piece of advice that you can but give he somebody. Said, and he said, you know, the other one, I mean, I was, you know, I was riding my bike in the park. But he was already know. saying that business, like knowing you were going to end up in. I think, well, yeah, I mean. In entertainment. I'll, I'll give you a quick two things. And the other thing was be kind to everybody because. You know, to the assistant because that assistant will be running the company in a few years. Yep. I was literally probably eleven, <laughs> um, and I did go to him and I go. You know, I remember coming home from school and seeing you know like snippets of of this is like pre, almost pre music videos, and they'd have like a Kiss commercial on TV, and you'd be like, oh my god, wouldn't it wouldn't it be amazing if they had like a twenty four hour music channel? <laughs> and I told him that, and he said, "Oh, it'll never work." <laughs> and then, like two years later, or whatever, a couple years later, MTV started, and I was like, "Ha, see!" Yeah. And he was doing yeah, Bob Pittman, and he goes, "I know that was your idea." And anyway, so um, yeah. So were you turning it? Oh, were you, I can go back to. Turning were you obsessive it off. about when did you learn how to play guitar? And were you naturally just like, "Yo, I'm gonna go all in," and maybe you didn't say, "Yo, I'm gonna turn," because you were <laughs> uh, you were twelve and. <laughs> I was actually well, yeah. I think uh, I've I have an older brother. I assume that's your first instrument. Uh, or is that a weird? Well, I started playing piano a little bit. Oh, uh, okay. I have this weird thing where I know everything and nothing. I mean, every day is an etch a sketch for me. It really is. I mean, I I I've been doing this my whole life, but you know, I can't. I've written a lot of songs, and I'm the worst guy at remembering my songs. Sure. I can't. I mean, every day it's like, let's keep going, let's keep going. Um, So I I would say, uh, I remember seeing a movie, and somebody played banjo in the movie, and I thought, oh, I'm going to play banjo, and I was probably five. And then realized, I guess I had a drum. 
was a drum and strings. So I was like, wow, two for one. This is awesome. And, uh, and <clears throat> uh, I have a brother who played piano and classically trained. And I was really, you know, I grew up in a, peer, a time which was great because it was very, it was a vinyl period of, of music. And so I have an older sister. And so in the back room was, you know, Dylan and Crosby, Stills and Nash and Hendrix and Cream and and then in the front room is show tunes and, mm. and you know hair and chorus line and the Fantastics and you know on and on and Gershwin and Frank Sinatra and so and I was my room was literally in the middle of those two places and literally playing listening to music constantly. And there was, I remember vividly have a, 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 I won't say an epiphany where um, I think when your parents are working, so I went back to, I was, I guess, alone a lot. So a lot of time to think, a lot of time to dream and imagine. And thank God there was a piano there. <clears throat> and thank God I knew how to play, put the needle on the vinyl and watch the labels go round and round. And I would sit, I was really young, and I would sit in front of these speakers and I would go, I want to be in there. This seems way more interesting than here. And how do they, you know, playing with the balance knob on Beatle records and just, you know, wow, the drums are on one side. Oh, the harmony. And start learning harmonies off Beatle records and start not knowing I, what I, you know, you're, you're, you're not conscious of, you're not like, I am studying my craft. No, you're just curious and you're following your little, you're curious. You're just following your bliss. And, uh, so I, um, but I knew I loved that world. I knew I loved that, that those sounds, and I knew that those sounds were helping convey melodies, and uh, chords, and the drum sounds, or just I just kind of became obsessed with sounds, which is also has a lot to do with how you play dynamics and how hard you hit a note. The emotion you sing. I mean, when you're writing a song, I, I have a weird thing about words and phonics and how the words sound. Oh, know, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I argue. I mean, I'm literally. I was writing with Bon Jovi last week, and we were arguing about. We're well, not arguing, but discussing. He was saying, "Well, it's this word," and I'm like, "Eh." He's like, "What do you mean, eh?" I'm like, eh, "It just doesn't doesn't sing well." Certain words you just know that are gonna that they're gonna sing well. I guess, I don't know, that's from experience. It's just something, it's not because I took a class. Are you, do you sing? Yeah, enough, enough. Yeah. I'm not, I would say I'm When a, you were little, were you singing? Yeah, when, when to you were, myself, you know what I mean? I wasn't... Did you ever write songs by yourself? Yes. What was the first song you wrote? Oh my God. You know it, too. No. You don't? I was thinking about this, because I knew you were going to ask this question. I was thinking about, there was a, my band in high school, we... You know, we did a you know we did a, our own little vinyl, and when I was thinking about one of the songs, and one you know I was thinking of these titles, and one was um, "Passion Play," "One Dimensional Love Affair," <laughs> you know, uh, "Giving Away the Ghost." Okay. What was the other one? Um, that thing's well, "Giving Away the Ghost." I like yeah, that. I don't think I rhymed "ghost" though. Dimensional is a, anytime there's a multisyllabic word in, in, in the title, I'm, I'm into it. Sounds it. Yiddish. Yeah, yeah, it kind of does. <laughs> like, um, I, I, it's oddly enough, I've been I just been, um, was working with Barbara Streisand. Oh, and, cool! And actually, the single's coming out tomorrow that I wrote. Amazing. Yeah, it was unreal experience working with her. She's I I love her. I, yeah. She's incredible. Tell and so we, so we get her. We got into <laughs> words that sound Yiddish that yeah. aren't. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> like title. <laughs> ah, I like that. Boyish appeal. Is a Boyish big appeal is uh, amazing. What did she? Say? She had something like. Um, <laughs> These she, are great. <laughs> oh, she had dish towel. Dish towel. <laughs> that was her big one. <laughs> towel. Uh, we had a fewer, so that was what kept us going in, in the studio. Couple alone. New Yorkers in. Uh, oh my in, god! On the she West went Coast. to the same high school as my mom. Okay. So she, it was. I don't want to get emotional, but it felt like at times, you know, there was a very, very. I felt very comfortable with her. Yeah, we had we hit it off right away. Did she know that? Uh, it came out in the conversation eventually, because she, she was from Brooklyn and sure. 
and I we can get I can get into that. So which was helpful when we were writing that kind of flow, that kind of um, and humor too. But so I would that imagine a, that was, your mom would be really impressed with this release. Um, there was a moment where I produced a song in the record. This is sometimes it's a helpful little thing. Is uh, there are a lot of records where let's say I produce well some songs, and then out of that I end up writing separately. Or sometimes sometimes you come in as a writer and then you produce what you write. Sometimes you don't produce what you write. Some that's that's almost I, sometimes that for me is great. You know, if you and I are working on a song and we write this, we do this demo and it's, you know, it's we kind of like the demo and then, you know, super producer, other cat comes in and he or she and, uh, boy, God, we can move on. We can go write some other songs. Sometimes it's... I suppose that's the joy of being a writer and not a producer. And, yeah. And, you know. But I think what happened to me, what led me, I know we're jumping around, but what led me to want to produce, I think for me, you know, the producer was the guy, you know, it was the film director for me. Yeah, he's and, Steven Spielberg. And the writer was like, oh yeah, that's cool. Right. So because, you know, I would write these songs and certain cuts that I would get early on and, you know, somebody else would produce the song and you'd be like, oh, that's... No, so how, do you, what do you, how, do, how do you look at Gift well, Horse in the Mouth? You know, you're so right. grateful you got the cut. You're so grateful for the opportunity. But nothing ruins a good song faster than production. <laughs> you know what I've learned also? And back and the video. Oh yeah, sure. I've, I've yeah. had this situation where you've written a song and they're like, you know, you get that call. Oh, you get that call. Mm. Hey man, first single. Yeah. You sitting down? Yeah. I'm, congrats. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're shooting the video. You know, this is the other thing that kills me. It was like, we're spending $350,000 on the video. Really? I'm still waiting to get paid. Right. And you gouge me over my tuna sandwich. Right. And, uh, and then you see the video and it's shit. Yeah. And you go, not only did the song just die. Well, this is when videos were really important, but you just, they just missed it. They yeah. missed the emotion that you know that we were trying. I don't even you know. It's like this is the great thing about the show. You never want to mention names, but you kind of want to. You really, um, but you can't. So it doesn't matter. The point is you, when you see the video and you, your heart breaks. Sure. And I've had it the other way where they've nailed it, and you think, oh shit, this is gonna go. Like you see all our hard work. You see everyone. Amicably getting along, you're still really close with the artist. You know, you, 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 they become friends. They're not a client, and and that's a whole other subject to talk about. Hey guys, it's Joe London, producer for the podcast and the writer is. So recently, I was sent a Play Five speaker system from our friends at Sonos, um, and I've been using it for about a few weeks now. And I have to say, I've been really, really impressed. You know, as a music producer, I'm always looking for a speaker system to keep up with my monitors at my studio, something that really represents the music that I spend hours and hours tweaking on in the studio. And um, this Sono system really, really does that for me. Whether I'm listening to music in the morning at a low volume or I'm cranking the volume for when I have a party or friends over, I feel like the Sonos just handles all that super well. And it's so easy to set up. You basically plug it in, follow a few steps on the app, and you're ready to go. The nice thing about the system as well is that all Sonos speakers and components work together uh, so you can customize your sound system. You can kind of start with one and add them as you go. I, I started with an original Play 1, and now I got them all over my house, including the Play 5. So if you want to go pick up a Sonos, I highly recommend it. I love them. Go to www.sonos.com for more information and uh, go pick up a couple. I'm going to keep going back so okay. we like kind of tell the story okay. linearly without telling it linearly because that's, that's, this is how that's I talk. what happens when you, when you have it, a, 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 <clears throat> a couple of Jews in a room. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, now, now people know what it's like to be in a studio and then be in a studio with a couple of Jews. Exactly. Um, Hello. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you end up in, <laughs> it's so real. If, if I talk to my mother, 
Like the. <laughs> I love a, how we're. Let's get real. If I talk to my mother. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Go you ahead. have to sit down because you're like, this is gonna be, you know, an event. Six six to ten minutes of having no idea where this is gonna go. Try to focus enough to get through the the conversation and. At the end, it's like if no, somebody to, asked me what the recap was, I'd be like, "I'm not sure, but I know that we talked." Right. It's but, sort of like which that, is which is, is actually great preparation for being in meetings with certain executives in this business because I've yeah. been in meetings with, you know, put X President X, and you've been, you know, you whatever you you're lucky to have the meeting or you're summoned or whatever, and you're sitting there. And their job is to make you as confused as possible. <laughs> and they sit there, and you're like, "Well, no, we really want you to work on this thing, and this is what you know, this is about it, da, 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 and you know, and you are, we're, we're going to offer you this deal." And, da, 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 da. and then you leave there, and, and you call your manager or whomever, yeah. and how did it go? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I think I got the gig. Right, or, but I don't even know what the gig is. But right. I think I got it. And, yeah. So there. Yeah, but that's an art. There's an art to that. Sure. Which. That's why having a Jewish mom is a great is preparation it, yeah. for that kind of, uh, you know, those kind of uh, meetings. Um, okay. Thank so. you, our moms. Okay, so you, the first real <clears throat> kind of breakout. Let we'll, we're going to jump forward because we know that you move to California in high school. You go to Beverly Hills High School. Is that when you start? You know, you get the record deal. That was much later. Much later, but you start producing in high school, or when do you start producing? <clears throat> I think what in high school. Um, what was your first time in a studio? Right. So I think what happened in, in high school is, which is super duper uber important, band rehearsal every day, six seven days a week. So high school. Go work to you know delivering pizzas or uh, delivering medicine to rich people in their homes and taking you know drugs to Tommy Chong and you know like delivering Whoa. medicine you know medicine and uh, but then you know seven o'clock was band rehearsal <clears throat> and uh, and guitar was or piano. I was playing guitar yeah guitar. so I was you know I I'm anyway so I moved to California wanted to get into a band. Weaseled my way into the jazz fusion band that was known as uh, CSI or Chronos and Clastic Infant Debulum, yeah. and uh, which had uh, some great musicians in it. One one of them being uh, a jazz artist named Boney James, who's a sax player. Who was his name is Jim Oppenheim, <clears throat> and um, played every party, played every club, open for. Uh, the Yellow Jackets and Ayerto and Flora Perim and Kitty Hawk and did the circuit, you know, and you could sold out the Troubadour, you know, that's huge. So Friday night, we were the house band of the Troubadour on Friday nights and Molly Crew was Saturday nights. So that, for, we did that for, you know, my junior year, senior year, and then uh, I went to MI, or back then it was GIT, um, but still- Musicians the Institute. Musicians yeah. Institute, and- um, uh, but still, was, which was great. So everything I learned in school, music school, I go to ply. Whether it was in a you know G major seventh arpeggio or a, or some lick that I would put in, because I was playing in you know original kind of fusion jazz. You know, which Were your parents supportive of going to MI and, <clears throat> and pursuing being yes. a so guitarist? You you asked that question before. So I would say at fourteen. Yeah. I remember the moment I walked into my parents' room and I said, I want to be a musician. I want to do this. And because I thought about acting, I thought about, I'd done a couple commercials and, <clears throat> and I thought maybe that might be an avenue. Um, but then I lost a part to Rob Lowe. And so I thought, okay, so much for my acting career. And, um, how did I know he was Rob Lowe at the time? He wasn't. How know. did you know it was Rob Lowe at the time? Well, because years later, you were like, "I know that." Guy. I was like, "That's the guy that got the part," and I didn't. And do you, you remember know. what the audition was for? Yes. What was it? It was uh, it was like an ABC after school special, you know, Billy, you know, teenage pregnancy kind of thing, and uh, how did how how did Billy deal with it? And I think it was something like that. And, uh, and I'm friends with Rob, and we actually told him that story, so it's pretty funny. Amazing. Um, so I went to my parents and I said, 
I want to be a musician. Now there's that long pause with any parent and um, they could have shamed me. They could have shot me down. And they said, all right, then be the best musician you can be. Then, then own it, study it, live it, just engulf your, just, just swim in it. And it's that good, was one of those moments. Good parenting. Yeah, that was a that was a big moment, and um, so that mean you know so I took whatever classical guitar lessons. I was you know awesome, awful. I couldn't you know I'm a bad reader. I'm too ADD, uh, but I, I have a pretty good ear, and so I could you know learn it. And I really wanted to you know learn rock guitar or certain folk guitar. I mean. So then I went, Paul Simon's brother had a guitar school, you know, Eddie Simon's Guitar Study Institute, which was on 60th and Madison. And went there every Saturday and took the rock class with Bob Greco and learned how to play Street Fighting Man. And, and then I took the finger picking class and learned how to play, you know, Hot Tuna and all the Simon and Garfunkel stuff. So because I love those kind of styles, you know, English blues or, and then also folk and which was, but I wasn't really writing. I was emulating, stealing, and trying to just just loved it. And so it's it's basically this. I'm the same person. So um, anyway, so super supportive parents. Um, I remember working all summer, and my mom matched me for my first uh, '70s Strat that I'm looking at your wall. Yeah, with the bullet, the bullet headstock, and. Uh, so yeah, so that's a hard tale. It's a 1972. Yeah, it's a hard tale though. So uh, you can play it later. Thank you. You so, you'll play it better than I do. So anyway, so um, but that was a big thing. It was 237 dollars in the case, yeah. and uh, you know got an amp at Manny's, and you know tried to put it in a cab, and bought a deluxe Memory Man, and a distortion box and I was playing along to Bowie records you know sure. and Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and Hendrix and anyway what was the band like when you <clears throat> you know you after MI mm. I'm sorry to jump forward Did but we, I'm, after, I, I will ski with you yeah go for it <laughs> uh, after MI um, is that when you start before you get into a, let's just write an album with it was that was many years later. That, that's, I'd had cuts. That you also. said you were 20, 26, so there's some time between yeah, yeah. twenty and twenty six. So I was playing, you know, around uh, L.A. and playing all the, you know, like Madame Wong's and all these great clubs that you could play. And uh, how did you survive? Were you just were you living at home? I was. Were you, I'm trying to think if I was living at home at this point. Pretty. I think I was still living at so it probably twenty. 21, still living at home. Um, I think 22, I moved out, got in a little apartment, 600 bucks a month. Yeah. Um, and I could make it, I uh, started doing production jobs. I worked for Dom Misher. Okay. Uh, does the Kennedy Center Honors, big TV producer. Um, mentor, Dick Clark. I was Dick Clark's assistant. Was, Whoa. Uh, I was a mentor. Um, learned a lot from those guys. Damn, yeah. Dick Clark at that point is the the guy because he was doing yeah. the uh, um, got Directors Guild bands. Awards. You know, he was doing, doing the Golden Globes. And, yeah. And, um, Did you ever feel like you know what, I'm going to go into television? Instead I thought of- that. I think my parents thought you know there was definitely that moment too when I was probably 26. I mean, I can talk that we can go into a whole thing. I was, I mean, I'll, I'll you know, well, you know, I stopped partying at around 26, 27. Started seeing a lot of my friends not last. And, and some of them were quite f- famous. I mean, I was friends with Basquiat and just, then he's dead. You know, I was friends with Halel Slovic, who was the guitar player in the Chili Peppers. You know, I mean, I still see Anthony to this day and we look at each other and go, Hey man, we survived. Here we are, you know. So I had a lot of friends, also high school friends that were dying, and I thought, you know, there's that moment. That is that an LA thing or is that an era? It was thing? New York too. A lot or of my York, friends from you know, I went to Dalton yeah. in New York, and a lot of my friends, you know, ended up at Hazleton. That was the joke was Dalton was going to have their high school reunion in Hazleton. You know, there were so many kids. It's a drug. Um, 
rehab center in Minnesota. So, so there was a period where I saw, for me, it was that moment of like, okay, you're good, but are you really good? Like, and I'll never know unless I get out of my own way. That was the voice that was going on inside my head. Like, you know, and I, and I had a friend of mine who took me out to breakfast one morning. He said, you're working at like 10% of your capacity and you're somewhat successful. Imagine if you stayed out of your own way and, you know, really got... Folk. That was a drug thing, you think, at the Everything. time? Everything, yeah, drugs and alcohol. And just yeah. for me, it was just, it was... Uh, I was tired of making excuses. Now, what you do in high school, I mean, we're, you know, we're living in a political climate that we could get, you know, but it, so, you know, I was a knucklehead in high school and did, a, uh, but I was super driven, which was a great work ethic I had for my family. And I was also doing what I loved. So I'm playing in bands and in, in, in my, I got a Porta Studio, Task M144, and I started a Juno 60 and a Drumatics drum machine. And then I got a DBX 160 and I got a Spring Reverb and then I got a GR300 guitar synth. And I started understanding arrangement. I understanding, oh, I can make this happen more by the way I arrange it. Or the way I stack harmonies, or the way so, and you're just um, woodshedding, and but you're learning the principles of recording, and oh, that mic sounds better back here, that mic sounds better over there, and 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 doing because I loved it, and trying to emulate things as opposed to this is my career, and I'm going to you know I got to get my check, and it was it wasn't about that. It's most of the time it's still not about that for me, you know. I mean. Uh, you know, I was listening to one of your podcasts the, the other day and uh, I too have written on a lot of songs that I didn't take writer's credit on, a lot. Yeah. I've written a lot of hooks that, you know, that are, I've won Grammys and you go, Whoa. oopsie, should I have said something? Should I have been more that guy? And, you know, then we have, you know, the Max who sits above all of us. And, <laughs> and no, yeah. you know, and you go, okay, so maybe that does come back. Maybe yeah. that. Well, you're still here. Yeah. I don't know about those other people. Maybe they, they're also still still here. Well, but my assumption is that en enough people who don't, add, I mean, who take hooks and don't give credit for it. My assumption is eventually people, those people stop getting hooks. Right. And I've had this, I literally had a conversation with somebody where we were having breakfast and, you know, somebody was like, oh, it was a TV producer. I want to meet you and talk to you about, it. I have ideas. And so I came up, he and I were spitballing ideas and uh, we came up for an idea for a show. I was sitting there just, and he pitched the show the next day. Show got picked up, D didn't tell me about it. It was my, I, you know, I'm just... And so the show became an HBO show, and the guy avoided me. And this is just one story. I got sure. a million of them. Yeah. You know, God, you know, I'm sure the book we could all write will we'll ne called we'll, we'll Never Work Again. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so one day I saw this guy, and he kept, I was like, hey, got a sec? Yeah. I said, you know what the difference between you and me is? Is I have those ideas every day. And you have to steal your ideas from people like me. Have a nice day. What did he say? <laughs> he, there's nothing he could say. He didn't care. That's the sad thing is, you know, those people just, you know, a lot, they just, they don't care. Sure. And, and then that show eventually goes away because it's not, doesn't have the people with the passion supporting it and creatively being a part of the team. Sure. So it's, you know, those are those lessons like, you know, cut and release. And those right, are those exactly. lessons that you learn. And how do you stay in, how do you stay in it and not be bitter? And how do you stay in it and still stay How do you hungry? stay in it and not be bitter? Um, well, I think I go through periods where, uh, I mean, I've definitely had peaks and valleys. I mean, you know, I've been... The new guy. I, I've worked towards being the new guy, and I've been the new guy. And you have a certain run or a certain sound or something. You have to be very careful of the sound. Um, you don't want to uh, corner yourself into a sound. 
So I think for me, that's why going to Nashville or writing country music is also a part of me. To me, a song, a great song is a great song. It doesn't matter if it's uh, country or pop or rock. Or just this, the, the genre is everybody else. That's not for me. I, I, I go, that's a good song. You know, I don't care what it is. Um, but there was, a, for me, that's why I loved going to England and working with Take That. I did a bunch of albums for them and had a lot of success, sold a lot of albums over there with those guys and uh, won a lot of awards. And now does that take me out of the pop world? Yeah, it did for a while. It took me out of the, that, that lane. Did the country thing take me out of the pop thing? I, I don't know. I think it's all part because of... Because it, it's not, it, it, it's all, you're, you're looking at it from, that sounds sort of like wondering what the perspective is of how other people look at your career. And I, I think in the end, it's if you're the guy who says, oh, no, I went to London and worked on Take That, and I've worked on you know Keith Urban or whatever in Nashville, and I'm working on Pop, or all the other things in Barbara and Bon Jovi or whatever it is. Like to, to me, at the end of your career, it's, it's more like I did everything I wanted to do, and... Uh, and I treated people around me well, and I and and and, and that's really because you know you, I always ask people this question where I'm like, sing me, and you might be able to, but I'm always like, sing me three Bach melodies mm-hmm. if you can, you know, and and inevitably the answer is just that they can't. Mm-hmm. And if you think of you know the greatest musicians of all time, mm. it, people would be hard-pressed to come up with three Mozart or Beethoven melodies. Maybe those two they could get. But like you start going to three, you know, so all the way up and down. And, and eventually... But people you won't, know those melodies. You might know, but I, I'm just saying that, that the idea of... of uh, leg, sort of legacy in that sense of who, you know, will... Did did it pull you out of the pop game? I don't even know what the pop game is. Good. good Somebody good. said to me good. earlier because that's the, that's the way I, I, I I'm the way our conversation a, is is yeah. kind of like my career. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, I literally just go, okay, that's cool. Um, Somebody said this to me this morning. I thought this was really cool that that pop music is not a genre; it's a result. Mm. And I was like, that's awesome. Wow. You know? Yeah, it's like that. This is. In the in the end, it's it, first of all take that's massively popular in that country mm. and in other countries outside of here. You know, it's like if you don't turn on one hundred five point one in in LA, you don't realize how popular country is. But if you only listen to one hundred five point one, you would think that's the most popular music in LA because there are a few million people listening to that station. You know, popular music is so but, in the eye of the beholder, and it's and and in the end, nobody's paying attention to anybody else's. Right, path. but I, you know, if, to use well, Keith as an example. You know, the day we met, we wrote somebody like you. So any, I don't know about you, but every writing session for me is is always emotionally the same, excitement and terror. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'm always fearful. I'm always, sometimes I'm prepared. You know, I have titles or maybe, I mean, I have a couple examples where I can give you where I, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to write with, uh, well, I'll jump to that in a minute. But so like with, with Keith, you know, we got together. I think he was nervous too. He told me he was. We started, he's a really fine guitar player and, we started playing and we came up with this lick and a four on the floor and I started doing kind of, you know, Bruce Springsteen impression and, and it was interesting because it was the, the arrangement of that song is, is more Dylan-esque in the sense of the writing. It's not like uh, verse, verse, or verse, B section, chorus. It was like, you know, it sure feels good to finally feel the way I do. I want to love somebody, love somebody like you. You know, which is, then where do you go? I want to feel the sunshine shining down on me. That's, so what is that? I don't know. When you put your arms around me, back to the, the, you know, the, so 
we were like, uh, is that cool? I don't know. We were, t- we, we, we were going back and forth on sunshine shining. Can we say, uh, I want to feel the sunshine shining down on me. Can we say that? I guess, you know, sure. I mean, is there, there's a perk of writing with that's that's the perk of writing with fewer people in the room. It's the two. I work best when it's two people. Yeah. If you have, if you have five or people, three. if you have five people in the room, and all it takes is one person to veto that idea, and they're like, you know what, that, that no. that's not cool, and then you're no. like, you come up with another thing. But if you have two people, no. then at least you have the excuse of like, ah, I don't know, and the other person, I don't know either. So like, no, it just or just really it, or just it sounds cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you hear sunshine shining. Sure. I want to feel the yeah. sun. Dun, 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 dun. I mean, that's cool. There's <laughs> a like, um, <laughs> there's a line. My my first like kind of real single was a mm. CeeLo song, mm. and in the middle of the chorus, it it says like, uh, um, for worse or for better, you make me better. Yeah. And I remember, right, what song like, is we that? Can, I know that song. It's a song called Anyway. It was the you know that global smash. No, no, no. it was. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and <laughs> Oops, no. Right, not n- not the not the smash. I thought my favorite moment of that, and this this just keeps going down this weird ass rabbit hole. But she, he, um, hello um, and welcome to two Jews yeah, and a coffee table. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, CeeLo had to perform. He hated the song, and he had to perform. Which it is in always front great of, when you yeah. you know you have this he, cut, and the artist just looks at you with disdain from the side of the in stage. The room, he walks in the room, um, and the first thing he says, "I don't like the song, Great. but I like Mike Karen, and um. I owe him because Mike gave gave him, you know, fuck you." And so he was like cutting this record that he doesn't like. I'm, um, I, you know, I wrote it with Ricky Reed and and uh, and Rivers Cuomo, which for me was incredible because wow. you know it's like my, sure. one of my idols. Sure. And CeeLo comes in, cuts the song. Is a pain. Is very difficult in the session. Which is just just those all those names. Yeah. Equating to the end pro, uh, is is just amazing. If you oh, stop, oh yeah, it, oh totally. See, I've I've done this. Where I saw them meet, and they had never met before, and I was like, "That's so cool that the song that I had something to do right. with introduced Rivers Cuomo with CeeLo Green." Which is the amazing thing about music. I've yeah. sat in a room and go, or you're on a, a on a plane or a bus, and you go, "Wow, isn't that wild that you're from?" You know, Melissa Etheridge and I used to talk about this. Like, wow, you're from Leavenworth, Kansas, and I'm from like 73rd and Central, you know, the West Side of Manhattan. Here we are in a bus in Ohio playing music. Together. It's just yeah. trippy. Or that I, you know, I stood next to Rod Stewart, you know, and playing guitar for him, and he's from, and it's just bizarre. It's just it really never. Is, it's, it's it's a creative melting pot. Like. I had a moment where I wrote uh, well, one of these. Country uh, country song, and I'm in a pew at the Ryman, winning you know country song of the year or whatever, and I'm thinking, holy shit, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty, you know, a kid from New York City, and uh, I, I think, have a country record that's that big. Well, yeah, at and, the Ryman. And, and I love Nashville, and I love the people there because they have that same passion, and they really care about the craft of songwriting. Yeah, and um, and it's not. And I'm, you know, I get into it. You know, I stare at a computer for a long time. Hey, 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 hey. You know, it's like, oh my god, with more reverb and the spring and hey, hey, hey. Ugh, it's just sounds. Really? Yeah. Sometimes I'm just like, oh. well. And I'm, you know, we all have to do it. You know, come on, that that dope hi hat against that. 808 kick with the fucking rip and the chip, you know. It's, it's so funny. <laughs> what is it like to win producer of the year? And were your parents there to see it? No. And, no? No. Why? They were at uh they were they were at home. I mean, yeah, they were at home. I don't know. That was what did it feel like to be nominated for that? It was it was a mind fuck a little bit. I mean it's amazing. I have, you know, it's the classic thing. I have an incredible ego with coupled with incredibly low self esteem. So, Whoa. Uh, um, you know, that's, that's, pr- so um, basically, I found out somebody came up to me and said, you know, you might be nominated. 
Now, that was a big year for me. I had a lot of number ones and I, I couldn't literally have worked harder than I did that year. Right. And, and it was like one of those years where everything kind of came out, everything did well. And um, so there's that thing where you get, you know, you get nominated and, you know, you're trying to be nice and you're like, wow, it's so, so appreciative and stay humble and be grateful, which, which I was. And, and, and you're just like, wow, it's, you know, that, that, all that, all the cheesy stuff goes through your head. It's so nice to be nominated. You're speaking on, on, on panels at USC and ASCAP panels. And all of a sudden, everyone wants your advice. Everyone's listening finally. <laughs> like, I'm the same guy I was, but now everyone's listening. And um, uh, the day, of the Grammys, I was sitting in wherever my row, and uh, T Bone Burnett sits down in front of me, and and then somebody walks over and escorts T Bone down to the front row or second row, and I was like, "Shit, here's your guy." Right. There's now I've been nom- I'd been nominated before, you know, for best rock song or producer of this or. Um, but there's something different. This was a big one, right? Yeah. This is producer of the year. We don't have songwriter of the year for the Grammy. No, so it's like and and I what I the year what I love, is, and I ended up being yeah. on the board of governors of of, of Naris. And um, why it's called producer of the year non classical makes no sense to me. Right. It's it, like dude, that's like right. you know, there's like eight jokes we can make yeah. out of this. But so anyway, so there goes T Bone Burnett down to the second row. And I turned to my, you know, my my crew, and I'm like, "Well, there you go." And I get up and I kind of walk to the back of the room. And in the back of the room, it's it's kind of a funny moment. Is is like like this is like the three wise men. There was David Foster, Bruce Hornsby, and Larry Carlton standing in the back of the room. And they all look at me and they're like, "Come here." And they're, you know using their hand gestures to bring me to them. I'm like, what? And they're like, and Dave Foster knew exactly what I was thinking because he's, you know, he's won so many Grammys and he's like, he goes, stop freaking out. This is your year. You're going to win. Sit the fuck down. Sorry if I'm cursing, but you know, sit the fuck down, enjoy the show, relax. I'm like, what? Do, what do you, listen, David Foster, you can't just like say this to me and, and here's Larry Carlton, you know, like three guys, in, you know, that I really respected. And um, I knew Bruce Hornsby because we, had, Melissa had toured with Bruce. So we uh, st- called, called me Armitage because the toilets in England are Armitage Shanks, like American Standard here. And over in England, they're Armitage that's Shanks. Right. So he still calls me Armitage. Anyway, yeah. so that's, thank you for that. That'll be fun when everybody <laughs> <laughs> starts. Yeah. Anyway, so, you know, then you sit down and you're listening and you hear, Juh. Now, Jam and Lewis were also nominated, but yeah. so if I heard "ja," "ja," I'm out. If I hear "ja," I'm in. And I heard "John," yeah. and I you and I started to laugh. I just was like, "Wow!" And so you know, and then I call my parents. So you know, there's about you win, they take the Grammy from you. You don't leave with the Grammy. Just yeah. just everyone needs to know that it sucks. Because you're like, I'll just take this one. I'm good to go. And I'm like, no, we got to take this. And um, uh, called my parents, had a nice cry, and then proceeded to, you do interviews for like three hours. And then you get, th- I, uh, a friend of mine who was a, uh, a guy I knew who was a journalist on E! Channel at the time was on camera. And I was coming out and I talked to him the night before at Music Cares, and he was like, "Wow, tomorrow's your day. This could be you could win." Da 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 da. And he's on camera, and he, and he, he's interviewing somebody like I'm the way I'm looking at you, but I was behind, and he looks over the person he's interviewing's shoulder, and he sees me, and I went, and he goes, "Hold tight." He gave me a, th- I know, I gave him a thumbs up. He said, "Hold tight." Brings me on camera, interviews me live. I'm with this. I'm in shock. You know, you're in shock. All of a sudden, my phone starts buzzing. Here's, you know, Keith Urban's calling me or whomever. And it's like, what the? You know, this is awesome. And um, yeah, it's surreal. It's, it was surreal. Now, what do you do? 
<laughs> well, I was gonna. I was gonna. <laughs> now, ask uh, that. I mean, yeah, I went to work the next day at eleven o'clock. I was working on a record at the time, and whether I won or lost, I would have been there. You still had a session. I still had a session. Yeah, there's you a know, lot. You of don't like, get any more respect the next day. <laughs> let's, sure. Let's put it that way. You know. I think the one thing you said is when people do start listening differently, though. I mean, you say that, but. Um, you know, when you're starting out, you're trying to impress someone in the room. There's sort of like a hierarchy, and you look at the person who's either like most successful somehow, and you keep asking that person if the song's any good. You know, at least when, when I feel like when I was first starting, I was in. Sometimes you're I doing would, that out of respect. Sometimes you know in sure. your heart that you think, oh, this is, I like this, and I'm trying totally. to be cool with you, and I'm like, because and that's why you became more successful is because you had that in you. I think no, I think no. It, you know what it is. And this is the you have to go. Let's say you're the artist, sure. And I go through this a lot because I've written a lot of songs with Bon Jovi. That guy is the man. He has to stand up there for hopefully for fifteen years, ten years, twenty five years, and sing that song every night. Every word has to, he has to believe every word that's coming out of his mouth. So a word that I think is cool, I'll give you an example. So this house is not for sale. Was the last record, last number one record, and I just had to twice. <laughs> just yeah. had to get that in. Okay. So the opening song, uh, these uh, on the song this house is not for sale. It starts the album. These four walls have got a story to tell. Uh, da 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 da. da there was a different second line. And the whole time we, and, and, and when we wrote the lyric, he was like, I don't know about that second line. I'm like, oh, it's great. It's good, man. He was like, I don't know. We mix the song, right? The day of mastering. I don't usually go to mastering all the time, but I happen to be going to this one and we were in New York. Uh, I wake up in the morning, my, you know, it's eight o'clock, man. Bing! It's JBJ. What's up? Meet me at Electric Lady. We're changing the second line in the, in the verse. I'm like, what? It's like, meet me at Electric Lady. We're changing. The, I, I have to sing this. Like, you know, I'm lazy. I'm like, I, really? Thank God I used an SM7 on them. Thank God. So we went to Electric Lady. We sat there with the second engineer and we matched, you know, we just kind of kept EQing it and EQing it until we, okay, punching in and out, comparing. Okay, boom. Got in the car and went to mastering. By the time we got to mastering, the song was there. Now that's, that's as close as I've, I've ever done it. Another example with him, there's a song called Who Says You Can't Go Home. He won a Grammy for it. Two, two parts of this story. So we, we'd written a lot of songs on Have a Nice Day. We were at the end of the album. And this is the job as a producer. You go to him. You now you could say, hey, man, now the band's all there. Richie's there. We're all there. I could say, hey, let's write another song. That's the writer in me. The producer in me goes, play me every song you haven't played me. Go into a shoebox, pull out dats, cassettes, CDs, anything on it. And he's like, no, man, we're good. I'm like, dude, please, let's, before everyone jumps on planes and leaves here, and he goes and he gets a shoebox or whatever, and there's CDs. I go, we're going to play Smash or Trash <laughs> fast. That's a great, <laughs> yeah, <I laughs> like which is the way game. I look yeah. at songs, Smash yeah. or Trash, you know? So, you know, because there's definitely that period I'm coming up, I'm like, I'm track seven guy. You know, I'm, you want a good album cut? I'm your guy, yeah. you know? Uh, but then when you start learning the single, you know, you know how to, you know, you try and craft them better and you start seeing, like we were talking about before, tempos and keys and the, anyway. So he goes and gets the song and, you know, I swear to God on this CD track 11, I was going, I was brutal too. I was like, I was like, I was like a bad A&R guy. You know, when you've worked so hard and you go into the, the office and you play your song that you're so proud of and they go... Nope, uh, nope. You're like, what the fuck? No. So I was doing. I was like, nope. And they, all these guys are like, now the songs they didn't care about, they started getting all of a sudden yeah. offended. Like, hey man, what the? I was like, well, you, you know. So I swear to God, song eleven was, you know, Richie and John and about going, you know, who says you can't go home? You know, it was like, I was like, whoa, what's this? They're like, oh, it's an, it's an, yeah. like no. 
that's that's a hit song. That that's a good one. I and I said I know why you don't like it because you you're equating it to when you wrote it. You think it sounds like you know this right. artist or this. I I hear the reference. We all came up through the same school. We all listen to the same record. I see where, where it's coming from. But let's not make it that. Let's make it this. So, you know, and there's the, no, we're good, man. I'm like, that's when you have to fall on the sword. And you go, no, man, let's go for it. Sure. And we, we everyone learns it. Everyone, you know, we get the three takes, boom. A year later, Grammy. And yeah. it's like, so that bought me some leverage for a while because sure. I was like, "Hey, remember that time?" You know, and he's like, I, "You know," he's like, "Okay, I'll listen to what you have to." Say. I, w- I worked <laughs> with him ahead. like like maybe two years ago, mm-hmm. and he he started singing. And it was a song that I had written, and to me, it was like the coolest thing in the world because mm-hmm. I've sung, you know, so many Bon Jovi songs at karaoke. So when you're when I had like the my iPad and I'm scrolling through the lyrics and he's singing you know lyrics that I wrote. I was like, oh my god, this is what surreal. song is this? Yeah. It didn't come out. Oh. It was not great. Um, I mean, you know, the song might be. I great. got a I got a pile of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he's you know it's my. <laughs> but it's trippy. I won't, I won't blow blow up my co-writer's spot, but he did say it was really funny because it took him you know a minute to warm up. Mm. But my friend's like, man, you're like an old amp. Because he turned, he actually said like, that to John. Yeah. Oh wow. He, yeah. He like <laughs> he turned on where it was like this warming thing where mm. it was like once he got up to speed, it mm. was like holy shit, that's Bon Jovi's voice, right? You know, and and some of these classic singers that you work with, you you know, you hope so bad that they have the same tone that that you hear on on records, and when you get a guy like that. Who has who's yelled in microphones on stage for thirty years? Mm. Most of their voices are trash, and they you cannot get them up to like the up to speed and warm. And when his voice is warm, it's Bon Jovi. It's like it's just there. But I always think of the, like no John he's is like an old amp. He's, <laughs> One of my well, I don't know if he'd like to hear that. But. No. But then, yeah, you know, sure listen, there's, I think there's a, that's but a, he is great. Yeah. there's a complaint I have where it says, you know, people expect, you know, that you can't warm up. You, you, they be, you know, we live in this, you know, now, 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 go, go, go time where, you know, this uh, idle X factory kind of, you know, you have to be perfect, you know, or I'm going to judge you on every flick, every run, every, where, you know, literally judge you. Literally uh, judge you, and I and I did the music for X Factor. I, 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 it's it's intense, you know. And I've been in a room where somebody said, "Oh, I was hanging out, you know, I was around Keith Richards, and how did I was like, how did he play?" He's like, "Well, took him a minute." It's like, really, yeah. shut up. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. He's you know, he's a literal Hall of Famer. It's like you know, all time great. Uh, you know, I. Does it take me a minute to get going and warm up? And yeah, sometimes it's like it does. I'm not, I, nothing bothers me more at times than like guys shredding, shredding, you know, the guitar center guys. That does nothing for me emotionally. So, what do you think of sort of, you know, when you work with Bon Jovi, Barbara Streisand, and those kinds of people right now, Mm. because you're literally working with them right now, Mm. does, um, do you feel like why work with them and not the the kid who just got signed? Is it because, or do you do both? And I, yeah, I do. I, I used how do to, you feel about working with like the the most venerable artists in their genres? I think there was a versus peer, you know, I know who, saying, who's not defined at all. When I okay, let's go back. Let's go back, back, back. So. Um, I was doing Fleetwood Mac as I was doing Michelle Branch's first record. So as I'm writing and producing her first record, I was also producing Fleetwood Mac. Or I was doing writing songs for Joe Cocker or Tina Turner or Bonnie Raitt. And I'm thinking, okay, I don't want to get stuck in this, but I have enough reverence and respect for what they have given me 
as artists and I'm a fan of theirs. So if I can learn something from them or just be around them, stories or their process. Um, I remember listening, uh, listening to songs with Joe Cocker. Yeah, Joe Cocker, you know, sitting in a room listening to a stack of, C- of music and we were picking songs to, now how I ended up producing him, God knows. But I had written a song for him five years earlier that had done well. It was a hit. And um, so then now all of a sudden, like, here's the irony. I, when I was playing guitar with Rod Stewart, I didn't think I'd end up producing him 10 years later. And I left his band amicably. And so when he walked in the studio, the first thing he said to me, he's like, boy, am I glad we, you know, we, our thing ended well. You know, that, so th- there was no weirdness when I was producing him because Clive... Davis wanted me to produce a record for him and and Santana. So there was never weirdness. So the point is that working with your heroes sometimes is incredible because listening to a song the way Joe Cocker listens to a song, he goes, well, there's no middle eight. I'm like, yeah, but the song's it's from Brian Adams, man. It's a hit song. He's like, mm, it's no bridge. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That song... You know, let me call Brian. I'll call Brian. And yeah, write a middle eight. I know him. Yeah. Let me call Brian yeah. and get him to write a middle eight. He'll do it. If that's the thing, or yeah. cut, cut or no cut, eh, let's move on. I'm like, whoa. I've seen that in Nashville a couple times. Where like, I don't know if that the lyric that lyric doesn't doesn't sit well with me. And it's and it is the second line of the bridge. You're like, yo, let's change the lyric. Right. Nobody, none of the writers care at all. But certain genres really respect the writers. Like, I can't do that. I've worked with Elton John where he was a line short. We were working on a song and he was a line short. And he literally went, hold on. Called Bernie? (laughs) Called Bernie. And literally goes, I'm a line short. You hear this, I mean, I was on his side of the conversation. And that's what I'm talking about. So when you're working with people like that, to see... How Elton John writes, yeah. You know how Elton John? I mean, I'm, I'm sure Bob people know, but for, for people who he gets don't, the lyrics and writes. So he he, yeah. I, we were working on a, a, a song that I had written with Gary Barlow that was going to be a duet with Billy Joel and, and Elton John. That's for, a cool for Westlife. It, it was for it was going to be they were touring together and they were going to put it on an album where they were doing each other's songs and there was going to be two new songs on the record. And I got a call and they were like, "You're going to write the songs." So I was like, "Uh uh-oh. So I called Gary Barlow from Take That, and I said, hey, man, let's write. So we wrote two songs. Elton loved the song, loved both the songs. Billy was like, eh, I'm not into it. It ended up being a duet with Gary and Elton on Gary's last solo record. It's called Face to Face. So So now this is how the idea was that Elton came in, sang Face to Face, was awesome, and then we were talking because we talked on the phone a lot. He's a great conversationalist. He loves photography. We were talking about uh, Elliot Erwitt and famous photographers. And um, he has a massive uh, collection of photographs. Incredibly interesting, fascinating guy. Anyway, um, so I said, so do you bring your lyric sheets? Do you bring your lyric, your stack of lyrics? And he goes, oh, they're in the car. So he goes and grabs, he sends somebody to go to the car Pulls out these lyrics, and I'm sifting through Bernie Taupin lyrics with Elton so John. So crazy. And, and, and I'm like, I, the moment is not lost on me. My engineer is like, oh, that's cool. I'm like, dude, like, no, this, this is, is, this this is, is why happened. we're here. Yeah. And he goes out and he goes, and we picked this one. It's, it hasn't been released still. I still it's, um, it's called King Kong. And it's about America hanging on. Oh, uh, interesting. It's a, it's a great idea. Yeah. King Kong hanging on to the Empire State Building and, and the metaphor, it's, it's America hanging on and it's, you know, it's, it's in trouble. And uh, so, he's, you know, let's have a go. I'm like, yeah, let's have a go. So he goes out. I, I know I'll do this fast because I know we're covering. But so he goes out and he sits at the piano and I'm just like, record. And Ellen goes, uh, BPM 123. Dun, 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 yeah. you know, or 124, or 120, whatever. Is that right? And is that 123? I just made that. I just threw that. No, I just didn't know if that was like, if you were oh, like, is that, this, oh, is like, that, I, don't know. I don't know. That'd be a good game. Um, so he goes, I get, it's on my phone. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> I'm sure you have a I'll BPM counter on oh, your yeah. phone. 
This ain't my first rodeo. That's right. This ain't your first Let's barbecue. See if we can do it. So he goes out there and we record him, and he he starts singing and playing, and and for about fifteen minutes, and I'm taking notes. I'm like one twenty three sounds like a verse. Two forty seven sounds like the pre-chorus. Five minutes and twenty. There's the chorus. Oh, there's the bridge. Cool hook at six minutes, and then and at twelve minutes, he's like, or whatever, fifteen. He's like, ah, ugh, this sucks. Forget it. I'm done. I'm like, mm, come on in. He's like, what? I go totally deflated, shot down, beating himself up. All the shit we do to ourselves, or I do to myself. You know, not that I'm comparing myself to him, but that just that striving for something, swinging and missing. Yeah. And I'm like, sit down, cowboy. Yeah. No way. Watch this. Minute 23. There's your verse. Oh, shit. Oh, there's your, here's yeah. your. And we put it together. And the highest compliment from him to me that day was, you remind me of Gus Durgeon. Because that's what Gus used to do. I almost started to cry. Because it was like, right. Just you piecing it together, looking for the nuggets, looking for the pearls. It's what we do every day, whether we're writing it or working on it or being around it or be watching it. You're, you're kind of like, oh, that could have been cool. You know, and so to see that that was his process and, you know, we got a song out of it and we built it up and well, hopefully it'll come out one day. For those who want to know, this is 123. Not too far yeah, off. Yeah. I wasn't too far off. There you go. Okay. Um, before we go to the next segment, I just want to, because this is actually the first time we've met, even though we have a lot of friends. A lot of friends. Family, yeah, so. our mutual friends. Um, do you have I any lo- personal life? Yeah, I have family and kids. And yeah. How I did just, you do it with all, with all this? That's, it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sure, you know, I know my family has the same complaints that I had with my parents. You know, that I'm, I, I've missed a lot of dinners and I've, uh, but, you know, my older son is working at, you know, goes to NYU, just turned 21. He's working at Atlantic, he's managing artists. Managing uh, producer writers, he's crushing it. And he works with Pete. He works with Pete, he? yeah, We're, and Craig, Pete and Craig, yeah. Dylan, yeah. yeah, and Jackson is a unbelievably talented uh, drummer and making beats and programming and right start. He's he's got uh, um he's 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 screwed. He's got he's got the bug. He's he's gonna go. And there's nothing you can do about it. I you know there this, ain't no cure. Yeah, and and more cowbell. Yeah, more cowbell. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh. you know, and love his playlists on Spotify, and they're just inspiring. And what I love is that you know it's from Sugar Ross to Miles Davis to Coltrane mm, yeah. to you know it's all over. It's eclectic. Yeah. And to craft work to you know. So I'm like, yeah, oh thank God, yeah, awesome. What's the best band of all time? Mm. You know, it's funny. I was driving. Here. By the way, I've never asked that. I know. In fifty something episodes, I've never asked that, but for some reason, I feel like you would know the answer. There, you know, there, there, there's a thing about a band. There's a thing about a band that I'll give you. This is this is. I'll give you the answer. I'll uh, give me two or three bands. Give me, you know, like it's hard to say one because there's a thing that defines a great band, and I've worked with. Um, I've worked with boy bands. That are sometimes the best bands, and it has nothing to do with picking up a bass or a drummer or a guitar player. I've seen the camaraderie with the Backstreet Boys. I've seen the camaraderie with Take That, where one guy is trying to sing a song, and maybe he wasn't the lead singer all the time, and wanted to sing a song, and the bands, I mean, um, and wanted to sing a song. I was going to give the example, but uh, so. And sang the song, and I helped him with the vocal. He was super nervous. And when the band came in, after I you know, put the vocal together, band came in, or the guys came in, heard the vocal, hugged him, cried. That's a band. So, yeah, that's so, awesome. So is that the best band? You know, I've been in bands where they're not even in the same room, and these are yeah. Some of the biggest bands in the world. And they hate each other. They don't, they, they, you know, it's convenient. It, when it's convenient, 
politically for them to be in the same room. Not mentioning a name, but no, but we can name a bunch of those. I feel but like. but I've it's also, much harder to find the bands that are emotionally supportive of each other. Right. So you could say what was the best band? I mean. You know, you could say the Rolling Stones, you could say the Beatles, you could say Led Zeppelin. You know, I saw, I mean, I saw Led Zeppelin. I'm, I saw Pink Floyd back in the day. So it's, you know, when you, I saw The Clash. When they came out and or I saw U2 very early on in 83 and The Clash. And when they came out, they attacked the audience. They were literally spinning. Bidding on the audience. It was so awesome. And you're like, that, and you just go, there's a fucking band. Yeah, right, there's right, a right. fucking band, yeah. you know? And you're like, it's like, no, fuck you. We're taking this. We're, you're coming with us. Yeah. And you too had it when I, you know, uh, Sunny Bloody Sunday and New Year's Day and the way they would come out in Gloria and they'd just come out and just be like, they yeah. just take it. I love bands like that. Um, you know, I've, I've seen, I've been lucky to be, a part of like when I first started playing with Melissa Ethers and watch her go from the van to the private plane and sell, you know, p- platinum records to diamond records, diamond. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and see that, that drive and, 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 and not getting an audience opening for the Eagles and not getting the audience to budge and talking then to them like molasses and just just slowly and then next thing you know they're on their feet turns around and winks at me uh, that's, well, a, she's, that's a great band when you know that's where you just hold tough and you don't cave you know and she used to say to me like when i make a mistake she'd like smile through your mistakes she was the first mm-hmm. name that i have on this next segment which mm-hmm. is five for five i'm gonna okay. name five people and you're gonna say the first thing that comes off the top of your head Uh-oh, okay first one melissa etheridge I just finished her record. We ju- we're mastering it today, actually, oh, believe it or not. Uh, hadn't worked with her in years, and we bumped into each other at, last year at NAMM. And anyway, f- okay, sorry. Uh, champion, bold, brave, courageous, inspiring um, sister. John Bon Jovi. Rock, uh, friend. Mentor, ally, um, general, leader. Clive Davis. Inspiring, um, smart, conscientious, uh, collaborative, believe it or not. Mm. Did I say legend? Yeah. Icon, I, legend. But those are normal answers, you know. But I learned a lot from Clive, being around I, Clive a lot. Um, and the amount of people who worked for Clive, that are, you know, Keith Nafley runs RCA, Pete Larry, runs Atlantic, and Larry Jackson, Larry Jackson. When I met Clive, uh, there's so many people who work from Rainey is the head of yeah, Sire. Yeah. All these people who worked for Clive yeah. run record labels. Like, not a, it's sort of what, um, in a way, the writers that were signed to Dr. Luke and how many of them, the Benny Circuit, mm-hmm. J Cash, mm-hmm. Bonnie, like just go down the list of the, the ammo, the gr- these the greatest writers of a generation. So many of them were signed to this one guy who, obvious, you know, regardless of of you know the plus or minuses in in people's uh, I don't know story, you can go and say Clive is a mentor to. A and R people, yeah. Like I mean, it, nobody must have. I, I don't know any other, cl- you know, A and R guy who had. But you know, that. but like you know, like my parents, <laughs> yeah. there are things you learn from Clive that you go, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the good and the bad. Yeah, you learn what not to do just as much. I as wasn't going to say him. that, but I, you, I can. You because, said that, you know. But I've, you know, but I'll tell you something. This is the thing, you know, going out having a meal with Clive. I remember the first time I had, you know, it was a bunch of us. I think it was Larry and. Steve Ferreira, God bless his rest his soul, and it was the, we were all out to dinner. And what I loved about Clive, uh, same with like Marty Bandier, people like that, is you, you. It's not when you go out to dinner with them. It's not really like so. Tell me about your cuts. Tell me about your you know no, what are you working on. Not. It's like tell me about your family. Tell me about your soul. Tell me what are your dreams. Tell me about your childhood. Tell me and you're like wow. Tell me, let's talk about art. Let's talk about movies. Let's this is about- this is the thing that Clive um, taught really well that I I think is maybe the best 
lesson you can give an A and R person, mm-hmm. which is be friends with writers mm. and art and producers. Mm. The artists Absolutely. come and go, right? But the writers and producers that last will continue to give you hits throughout twenty years. Those artists, you're struggling to find the hits, but a lot of them have their own thing. They they become a flash in the pan. But writers and producers, you know, those are the those are the lifeblood of. But I, I mean, business. you know, listen, as when you're a writer and you get summoned to the bungalow. You know, when he used yeah. to do those bungalow thing at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and you, you know, they, would be, they you'd walk in, and there'd be the, you know, the, the food and the flowers, and there's all his A and R guys, and you know, it's going to meet the king. And yeah. I, the first time I went there, I guess there was a, like a miscommunication that was like yesterday, where I was going, I thought for a production meeting, and uh, a lot of pleasantries, and finally said, "So, what'd you bring me?" And I. I Nothing. That's why you're here, you know. I thought you wanted me to produce somebody for you. I'm sorry. I mean, back then at the time, and, you know, that's what uh, I thought was what it was for. And I literally, he goes, Well, you must have a song or something. And I, I literally hold on and I went into my backpack, and at the bottom of my backpack was a, like, it was literally like this a rough, of a song called "Gone," and it, and um, I played him the song, and I was so scared. I played, you know, I first off his speakers were out of phase, so I fixed the speakers in the <laughs> room, and then I'm sitting playing this, the 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 song, and then super nervous, and the song ended, and I turned around, and there's Larry Jackson and Clive, and and and, and Clive goes. So Larry, what do you, you know? What do you think? And Steve, and God bless Larry. That's a hit, man. That's a hit song. He goes great, Kelly Clarkson. So it's not since you've been gone. It's called Gone, and it was on the same record because Max and I did half. I did half, and Max did the other half of that record. So I did Breakaway. Max did since you've been gone. The only experience I had like that. I was. This is <laughs> this is yours and not mine. But I I just since we're meeting, I'm just telling you these stories. Back, um, L- L.A. Reed. The, I, w- I went in to go meet with Chris Anacute, who's an A and R guy. You know, sure. sign, helped sign Katie and some of these other things. And he's over at Epic, and I went to go meet with Chris and and L.A. Reed. Like peeked his head in, and and Anacute said, "You know, L.A., come in. You got to meet Ross. You know, mm. he's a he's a hit songwriter." And L.A. said, "Well, well what have you written?" And he goes, uh, "You know, he wrote he go he wrote." Uh, Dangerous, dangerous woman, and you know something else. And he said, "I don't, I didn't like that song." And LA then, said that, yeah, yeah. Wow. And then he sat down. And he goes, "Play me a hit." And I said, "Okay." And I played him the ballad I wrote on the uh, Megan Trainer album that was his, that called "Hopeless Romantic," which is one of my favorite songs I've ever been a part of. Mm. And I played it for him. I said, "You have this song." You never released it as a single, and this is a hit. And I okay. played him his own song, and? and and he was like, "That's a hit." And then the next day, did, it was like, "Did it become a single?" To, they never, they didn't release anything else from the album, oh. and it was sort of like at the end of the album cycle, and it was like back and forth. We added drums to it. We did all these right, things trying I'm, to like get it prepared like <laughs> right away. It went from you know being dead to let's go make this happen. But you know, everyone has. You know, their own journey. I, I I don't fault anybody for not making that choice, but no, no, you have to do that. You have to do that because that, you know what that I, does. I went and I, I put it back in his face. I felt really good about it. And, and to his credit, you, wait, wait, you have to do dude. that. You have to do that because it also shows him that you're diligent and you're willing to to to, to go down the rabbit hole. Yeah, and then he knows he can count on you. Yeah, that's a big. That's, that's on, a big by the way. That's on still. Let's listen like to that hurts. Song. I love that song. Okay, <laughs> um, number th- four. Oh. Um, you, I could see this being a thing where it's like seven hours later. We're like, are you still here? And like, yeah. um, <laughs> he won't leave. Your dad. Oh, my dad. Uh, heart, uh, soul, uh, leader. Uh, you know, I would say uh, visionary. Maybe lost a little. Misunderstood, um, but 
love, just love, 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 love. Same with yeah. your mom. Same with my mom. You know, uh, big heart, funny, charming, witty, sharp, gr- uh, gracious, driven. Uh, yeah, focused. Well, I'm sure she'd be unbelievably proud of the work. You know, obviously she was able to see a lot of of your success, but I'm I I can imagine you know working with someone like Barbara Streisand for any New Yorker is like mm. you know is and, and it's is you know that's what you that's literally what we were brought up. I remember when she did her special on like HBO or something. My mom and my sister were like. It, it was like the whole night was based around Barbara Streisand. Like yeah. it's it, it, to certain people, and nothing has changed, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> to cer- to certain people, that is the that is the top. That is you know, um, it's certainly in what she has done. So that's that's amazing. But but I think it's also you know, listen, when you get in a room with that with Barbara, it's also important. To, you were talking about before to get with young artists and iconic artists because you learn so much from young writers and young artists as you do from uh, icons. You know, you see everyone's process. Yeah. So you know when to kind of, at times, to call somebody on their shit. Yeah. You know, both ways. Mm. So, I mean, there was a moment we were in the studio and I said, hey, can we go back and revisit the first verse? And she's she's like, uh, what's wrong with it? I'm like, well, you, you can know. Be better. I said, and I was like, <laughs> you I said, let's it. put it this way. When I'm saying, hey, would you mind doing that? That's actually me saying we need to go back. She's right. like, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. That's cool. Well, uh, thank you for doing this podcast. Mm. That's um, it. <laughs> exactly. Well, um, there's you know, so many songs we didn't even. Talk. Well, I know, and that's it. You know, one of the one of the problems with having an interview is somebody who has withstood, <laughs> who's withstood, the, who but but who's withstood this the sort of proverbial test of time and is still working. Mm. Like, had you retired ten years ago or fifteen years ago, maybe it'd be a little easier to interview you. But it, it's you. It's you. It's you who decides. You know what? I'm not done yet. I want to work on more things. And you're mastering an album, Melissa's album. You just finished John's. You've got one coming out with Barbara. You're still doing all these things. You've, you know, children in the in the business now, and you've got so much happening still. So when we interview somebody who is, you know, 25. Mm. And has had five years of professional experience. We can rip through their songs differently, and it's and it's a little bit about you know how they see their future and a little bit of their past. But there isn't a, as as much past, and they don't have the experience of working with Elton John. I don't think that when when people ask, can you talk more about process? Mm. You know, how do you write a hit yeah, song? Yeah, I thought- you know. Um, to me, mm. I don't think that that's how people learn how to write songs. And yes, it is. You need to go and listen to songs, how they're written. And like we said earlier today, if, if we played any amp from a Who record, you would know what it is because you studied it. No, but we we were also talking about um, when I've worked with certain artists, did you know it was a hit, right? Yeah. So, so I got oh, there was... A period where we were on years ago, I was backstage in Bruce Springsteen's hanging out in our dressing room, and it was the two of us alone. And I said, did, When you wrote Born to Run, did you know? And he's like, I knew on that one. He goes, But the interesting thing is, Thunder Road and Born to Run started out as the same song. Oh, weird. And I split them. And he goes, And if you listen to Thunder Road, it's a young man's song. He goes, I would have never, I'd never write that song today because it's all verse. It's all yeah, verses. It's just There's verses. no chorus. Yeah. He said, "Born to Run" has a chorus. You know, he goes, "But Thunder Road," and I was, and I'm just like, God. "Keep talking, keep <laughs> talking, keep talking, go, talking. buddy." Right, right, right. You know, and so, but um, that's what's amazing when you get to sit with certain artists, and you, and I know what that song means to me, or that artist means to me, and when you. Get a, a, just a just to crack the door a little bit on their process, 
in that sense, it's it's really helpful. But that's that process there of having the ability. What you just said, where you can say, "Look, you can beat this." Okay. Or when you-, you talk about about that with Bruce Springsteen, that is more valuable. Okay, let me ask you a question. Story. Have yeah, you ever taken sure. worked on a song? Song never came out, and you've used that phrase somewhere else in a different song. We, well, yeah, I mean, have you ever the, used a lick from an old song and put it in a new song? Sure. I mean, one of the things that you know, there's Motown used grapevine in like five songs. Right. You know, it's like that. It was something that worked. So you know, you know, it's the same thing. Why wouldn't people? There's use a the Lou same Reed song sentence? where Bruce, um, he says. Born to Run in it. There's like he comes in and sing. Oh, I could play the song. I guess the point is this: is like I I want people to learn how to, in a way, survive as a musician. It's just it, it's it's important to see people like you still working and pushing yourself, and having a family and figuring it out. All of us are workaholics. Uh, all of us struggle with balance, and. It's it's just good to see people do it gracefully, and to continue to do it and support this next you know support the next generation of writers um, while still being part of it, you know. So uh, you know, again, thank you for doing this. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very important, you know, to do, you know, learn from everyone coming up and and. Anytime I get to work with career artists or uh, young writers, it's it's you, you come away with something. Yeah. So I think it's all part of the journey. And I think you know, quickly, one thing I remember, I think uh, I think it was David Hodges, or it might have been Busby, yeah. said, you know, the great thing about Nashville is it's just it's talent. It's it's not your age. And and I don't know. I really got that. Where it's 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 what you're bringing to the room, and it shouldn't matter whether you're you know a, starting out or it's it's really your your drive and your energy and your talent. Yeah. So that's age is superfluous. As far Absolutely. As well. Yeah. Well, thank well, thank you. you. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of And The Writer Is. If you want to hear music from this songwriter I just interviewed, be sure to check out our Spotify playlist or visit our website at andthewriteris.com. And The Writer Is is produced by Joe London, edited by Miles Bergsma, and published by Big Deal Music. A special thanks to David Silverstein from Mega House Music and Michael White. Until next time, this is Ross Golden.